This is a production of the Center for the Study of Science where we're interested in the intended and unintended consequences of the interaction between science funding and policy, uh, largely at the federal level, but <clears throat> in the issue of biotechnology, of course, there's a much more diverse uh, funding base than there is for many of the fe federal regulatory technology issues. Uh, and I think that may have played out a little bit differently. So we're here to discuss that today. Uh, before I go forward, I have to ask for the usual. Uh, please turn off your cell phones or make sure that they're off and not going to beep or anything like that. Uh, and when we get to the Q&A, uh, please do wait to be called on and we'll give you a microphone so we can record your immortal words. And uh, we would like you to state your name and affiliation before you go forward and please ask questions that are less than 500 words. Uh, now, first speaker at uh, our, our gathering here, uh, only a little, little bit of format. We're going to have three brief presentations, followed by a case study in uh, the issues in biotechnology, which will pertain to cotton in India, a very interesting one. And then we're going to take questions from the audience and from Twitter world. Uh, we have quite a Twitter following for this, uh, and we'll be interested to see what they have to say. So, the first speaker is John Antine, who is the executive director of the Genetic Literacy Project, which examines media coverage of agriculture and human, human biotechnology. He's a fellow at George Mason's Center for Health and Risk Communication and the STATS group there, that's an acronym, and a longtime visiting fellow from the American Enterprise Institute down the road. He's a columnist for Forbes.com, uh, Britain's, quote, ethical corporation and Australia's Cosmos magazine, among many publications. He's written seven books, two on crop technologies. He spent 20 years as network television as a producer and executive for NBC and ABC News, won two Emmys and 20 journalism awards, and is an all-around smart guy. So I'd like to introduce to you John Antine. Thank you, Pat. Not sure I recognize the person you introduced, but um, I'm very appreciative of being here and really happy that uh, Cato uh, is willing to engage um, this very important issue. Um, I, as, as Pat mentioned, we want to welcome the, the, uh, the, the, the world of Twitter to this. Um, this uh, event is being um, uh, streamed on at least three websites, uh, Cato's website, uh, Genetic Literacy Project, and also Biofortified, um, and we'll talk a little bit about all of them today. Uh, and we are taking questions, and we have a hashtag, hashtag uh, GMO Forum. Uh, so at any point, send in your questions. We will collect them. And um, in the second part of the program, we'll be um, uh, taking your questions on this. Uh, genetically modified organisms, genetic engineering, biotechnology, all those are ways that we discuss this. We can appreciate why um, any debate over farming food and modern technology can turn very contentious. Contentious. After all, we are talking about our children, we're talking about health, very personal issues to all of us. Um, the one thing I think we can agree upon, even among differing factions on this, dispute, disputants on this, on all sides of this discussion, all of us want abundant, highly nutritious food produced with the least environmental impacts. Now, when this uh, event first came together a month or so uh, ago, two prominent critics of crop biotechnology um, Gilles Eric Serolini, who's a French scientist, and Jeffrey Smith, an activist, um, agreed to participate. They are among the most prominent anti biotech campaigners, uh, but two weeks ago they decided they could not, or in one case would not, participate. Uh, rather than lose the opportunity to address this controversial issue, we decided to transform this debate into a forum. Uh, we do welcome, at any point in the future, their um, willingness to engage in an open debate. This was going to be literally a, a first-time event where um, people who, in, in, at least in our minds, are supportive of the science, uh, empirical data, versus critics who believe that biotechnology is quite dangerous. Um, I, I want to take just a, very quickly an informal poll here just to gauge how this audience feels about biotechnology. Um, how many people in this audience um, are generally accepting of genetic engineering? In other words, you believe that foods grown or animals grown through the use of biotechnology are safe. Could you raise your hands? Well, a fairly sizable majority. How many people believe such foods should be avoided because they are harmful? Um, 
few people here, so much smaller in numbers. Are there any who regard themselves as undecided? Okay, so there's, a, there's definitely um, a, a range of opinion on this issue. Um, highly contentious, and we're going to try to discuss some of the issues today. We can all agree on the goal, as I mentioned, a sustainable food system for our families, and one that can support a growing worldwide population. But how do we get from here to there? Um, Clicking the mouse. Oh, there he goes. Um, global food security is a complex challenge. We will need 70 to 100 percent more food by 2050 to match population growth. We can have organic gardens. That's a great choice for some of us in affluent countries. But if you're a citizen of the world, we are literally in crunch time, and organic farming will simply not feed enough children. One thing we know is that technology must play a central role, just as it did in the Green Revolution. Beginning in the late 1940s, genetic research led to the breeding of high-yield grains. Combined with the use of new fertilizers, herbicides, and pesticides, output soared. Since 1950, world wheat production alone has increased by more than 300%. But scientists agree that conventional modern technology alone is not enough to meet growing demand. How do we get from here to there? Although no one thinks it's a silver bullet, most policy experts and scientists believe that genetic engineering is critical if we hope to address global food security. Many of us hear the wild accusations about biotechnology, but don't quite understand how it works. It's actually very straightforward and elegant, and not very revolutionary from a science perspective. This is an illustration recently posted a month or so ago online by the Food and Drug Administration. Over many centuries, conventional selective breeding has turned inedible wild grains like corn and wheat into delicious modern varieties, but it is imprecise. As the FDA notes, these genes may include the gene responsible for the desired characteristic, as well as genes responsible for unwanted characteristics. In other words, it's trial and error. Unpredictable and often harmful traits are passed along, and it can take decades to weed them out, when that's even possible. In contrast, Genetic engineering, crop biotechnology, can, in the words of the FDA, introduce the desired characteristic without also introducing genes responsible for unwanted characteristics. It's precise. Considering its ability to tweak only targeted characteristics, it's easy to understand its attractiveness to farmers. Introduced first in the mid-1990s, genetically engineered crops are now grown by more than 17 million farmers in 28 countries. 81% of the world's soybeans, 81% of cottonseed, 35% of corn, and 30% of canola are now grown from GE seeds. Almost all GE crops are based on two well-known, well-established, and rigorous tested technologies. We have the GE genetically engineered BT and herbicide-resistant technologies. Crops that produce a bacterial protein known as BT are one of them. It's naturally occurring, and it's widely used by organic farmers to kill selective insects. Genetically engineered BT crops simply produce their own BT. The effects are identical to what happens on organic farms, which is what makes protests against BT crops seem so bizarre to scientists. The net result is that BT crops increase yields because farmers lose fewer crops to insect pests. The other major GE crops are those engineered to be herbicide resistant. They require the use of less and milder chemicals. That, induces, that reduces inputs, costs, and labor for farmers. It's agricultural sustainability at work. In the US, in the, US the use of herbicide tolerant soybeans, cotton, and corn, and pesticide resistant BT cotton and corn has soared since their introduction in 1996. It's now estimated that 90% of the farmers around the world that grow GE crops, 15 million, are resource poor. They come from developing countries. The total acreage using GE crops in the developing countries now exceeds that in the developed world. The idea that GE technology is based in the United States and dominated by the United States has been true for a long time. That is changing. And you, as you can see, the trends are dramatic and will increase, increasingly show that the developed world has been and will be embracing this technology. Despite the worldwide boom, the controversy, though, has not abated, particularly in Europe, where GE crops for food are banned, are banned or heavily restricted. Europe, by the way, has a net deficit in food and must import its food supply. 
Um, why do we still have this controversy? Many people, particularly those who call themselves progressive, embrace, embrace what might be called naturalistic beliefs. Simply said, they consider genetic engineering an abomination, a scar against the natural order, which they believe is naturally good and safe. Activists paint a scary picture of modern technology. Mad scientists hold up in their labs, tinkering with the keys to life itself, playing God. Genetic engineering is portrayed as untested and risky. Something is bound to go horribly wrong. To judge from their rhetoric, what they call the Frankenfood Revolution courts health epidemics and environmental Armageddon. These are not words that I'm making up. These are words from websites. These are words from mainstream critics of uh, genetically modified foods. That's the kind of language they use. They paint apocalyptic scenarios of what they call a brave new world. The activist's greatest ire is focused on Monsanto. It's the evil face of a scary industry, the spawn of the devil in their eyes. Being first out of the box with a new technology created an inviting target, obviously, combined with a massive popular mistrust of government that we see in the political left and the political right. We have a recipe for generating anti-globalism nightmares. Monsanto, activists say, is trying to take over the world's food supply, and government regulators are its willing puppets. This may sound like black helicopter conspiracy theories, but it's believed by tens or hundreds of millions of people around the world. It's entirely mainstream from GE critics. You expect to see such views on anti-biotech sites like naturalnews.com, Mother Jones, or from the organic industry, the Organic Consumers Association in particular. But sadly, they even show up in places like the New York Times. Yes, the New York Times. Um, let's take a look at a video podcast posted just a few days ago on the Times site. It's an interview with Michael Moss, who is an investigative reporter with a paper. And I would say, brace yourself here. OK. Among the things, uh, among the things Michael Moss said, what he, well, there's two major points he made. One, he, he says that people are realizing that genetically modified organisms are really scary stuff. Where does he get that information? He gets it because he has family in Europe that have told him it's really scary stuff. This is an, a crack investigative reporter who hasn't talked to scientists, but he talks to his family in Europe and quotes them of saying, look how scary genetically modified organisms are because you are like taking um, genes from one organism and putting it in another. We'll be discussing the implications of that later on today. But most em embarrassing to, um, I think, the Times, uh, let alone to uh, Mr. Moss, is that he says research on genetically modified foods really hasn't been done. If you follow organic consumer sites, if you look on activist sites, what I would call the talking points of the anti-biotech movement is the line that we've hardly done any studies on genetically modified foods. So this is a risky enterprise. In fact, um, I'm really not sure what that person, what Michael Moss is talking about, because there's literally been more than 1,000 studies on GM crops and food. In fact, there's a database, which we'll be discussing today, which catalogs most of them. In fact, scientists relying on we have a situation where Michael Moss is relying on what I would call paranoid gossip from his family and not talking to scientists. What happens when you talk to scientists about this? Besides the thousand or so studies, not one of which has documented any harm, not one has documented any harm to human health, we have almost every, not almost, every major scientific organization in the world that deals with these kinds of issues um, releasing statements about biotechnology and about its safety. For instance, the American Academy um, for the Advancement of Science here in the United States. The science is quite clear. Crop improvement by the modern molecular technique of biotechnology is safe. The National Academies, no adverse health effects attributed to genetic engineering have been documented in the human population. The World Health Organization, no effects on human health have been shown as a result of the, of the consumption of such foods by the general population in the countries where they have been approved. The European Commission, again, this is in the center of anti-biotech fever. Um, there's a great distinction between what the scientists say and what the politicians who have voted in bans have said. The scientists unanimously say no scientific evidence associating GMOs with higher risk for the environment or for food and food, feed safety than conventional plants and organisms. And probably the country where the um, opposition to genetically modified foods and crops is most intense is Germany, and you go to the, um, the Union of German Academies of Science and Humanities, equivalent to our um, uh, AAAS, 
And they say foods from approved GM crops are safe for humans and animals. Approved GM crops do not pose environmental hazards. These are not wishy-washy statements. So we have more than 1,000 studies, hundreds of them totally independent, and the ones that are not independent, the, the data was independently reviewed by governments, and they all, all show the same thing. There was no dangers from human health. Yet we have this perception perpetrated by the New York Times, among others, that there hasn't been a lot of studies done about this. The current media obsession with conspiracy theories threatens to obscure what I call pioneering developments, biotech 2.0, tweaking traits, many of which will more clearly benefit consumers or directly help the environment. Carl will discuss this in more detail, but I'll quickly run through some. We are developing crops that greatly reduce the need for polluting fertilizers, that show resistance to drought and floods and might act as carbon sinks. We have new animal breeds and even innovations to protect us from nature's uh, dangerous side, for instance, by knocking out the proteins in fruits and nuts, like peanuts, that cause debilitating allergies. I was contacted once by a uh, biotech um, activist who says, how can you um, be, be writing positive things about biotechnology? Look at the soaring rates of, 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 of uh, allergies, uh, peanut allergies in particular. The reality of it is there are no genetically modified peanuts, and we have an opportunity to knock out the protein that causes those allergies, but it's being opposed by people like that person who wrote to me. Many of these innovations languish on laboratory shelves, victims of media disinformation and activist campaigns that have paralyzed the regulatory process in country after country. It's tempting to categorize this controversy as a battle between science and ideologues, but that would be simplistic. Every new technology generates critics who envision a calamitous future. These are emotional, even religious issues. Science can only take us so far. Certainly, all criticism should be heard and deliberated, but it is hoped that everyone's views will be founded on honest data and reasoned analysis. Can we have a civil discussion? Frankly, I'm discouraged. When I conceived this event, I sought out as participants two leading anti-biotech groups, the Center for Food Safety and the Union of Concerned Scientists. They are considered mainstream critics, although it's often difficult to distinguish their views from conspiracy peddlers. But they simply did not want to dialogue. They turned down or ignored my invitation. I believe both Smith and Seralini promote um, blatant falsehoods people who are going to appear today. But whatever one thinks of their credentials, they have emerged as potent voices, their views echoed on thousands of natural, organic, or progressive media sites. They've contributed to what British journalist Mark Linus notes is one of the greatest science communication failures of the past half century. But they are among the most quoted anti-biotech crusaders in the world. For that reason, they are the centerpiece of the next presentation by Kevin Folta, who will discuss with you the myths and the truths of biotechnology. Let me introduce Kevin here. Uh, Kevin is Associate Professor and Interim Chairman of the Department of Horticultural Science uh, at University of Florida. His laboratory is working on the role of light and plant development and productivity and how genes and small fruits contribute to consumer desired traits. He's edited two seminal texts on genomics and genetics of fruit crops. He's an editor of four journals and has authored many book chapters and over 60 peer-reviewed papers. He's been recognized with several prestigious awards, including a National Science Foundation Career Award. He writes the, the, he writes the science blog, Illumination, and is a frequent lecturer and guest on science programs. And I'd say with 60 publications that quickly, uh, you really don't want to be full-time chairman. So I hope it's him. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see about that. <laughs> It's really a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation, and thank you to Cato for sponsoring this event. Um, I really come to you today as a scientist and as a teacher. Um, I've been studying this field as long as I can remember because I've always been really turned on by the idea that uh, by, by using genetics and genetic technologies that we could solve some problems. And I've been interested in this following it for 25 years. Uh, as a scientist and teacher, I've always been very interested in food safety and food security, um, how we can do more with less impact to the environment, how we can make better food, uh, higher nutrition, maybe better consumer qualities. All of these things are part of my uh, program now and in, in, in thinking forward. And I do believe that biotechnology is part of that solution. As with anything, it has strengths and weaknesses. And what I'd really like to talk to you today are some of those, some of the um, uh, facts behind uh, biotechnology, some of the ways that humans have been genetically engineering plants for 20,000 years, 
and give you some ideas about the mechanisms of how the crops work. I'll also conclude with a problem that I see, and that is the use of fear to persuade. So I like to try to change people's attitudes by teaching them, giving them the facts, giving them the tools, saying, go double check me. Okay, don't take my word for it, go confirm it on your own. I give you a starting point. But this is in stark opposition with those that want to stop the technology, who will stop at nothing to do that, including using fear, uh, using misinformation. And I'll show some good examples of that today. So what's natural? And many people will say, Biotechnology just isn't natural. And when you sit down and look at the history of crops, the crop domestication that's occurred over the last 20,000 years, there's very few things that any of us would really call natural. Humans inter have intervened in the breeding and selection of crops for most of this time, uh, for 20,000 years with some crops, uh, more recent times with others. Uh, the first thing that's not natural and those of you who are uh, watching um, on webcast from North America and those of us here, is that none of our food, or very little of our food, actually comes from here. The origin of domestication of most crops comes from other places in the world, and things that came from the United States or North America were really confined to maybe blueberries, strawberries, and a few other crops. So none of these naturally belong here. They're all from someplace else. The other important facet of this is the human intervention in changing the genetics of crops. So the humans, when they first were foraging, they would look for um, twigs and roots and small things for, for sustenance. And only with human identification of superior genetics, just because it performed better, it, it stored longer, it tasted better, did humans step in to genetically modify crops through breeding and selection. These are some really nice examples, some real nice uh, milestones that I like to point out. Uh, corn, modern maize, was founded on something called teosinte, uh, a, basically a bushy weed with small ears that had maybe 13 hard as rock kernels uh, that could be uh, ground into a pulp and then used for food. And only after 20,000 years of careful breeding and selection do we have the beautiful large ears that we uh, see before us today. Um, another one is another good example of human um, genetic engineering through breeding and selection are things like bananas that take a relatively difficult to eat wild species and domesticate this and turn it into something that we can really use and all find useful. Uh, the one I show here, the standard Cavendish banana that we all find in grocery stores now, has uh, one extra set of chromosomes. Talk about a major frankenfood. It doesn't make its own seeds. So the opponents of biotech who say you can't save your seeds from corn, well, you can't save them from banana either. This is a way in which we have an improved fruit food product that's highly nutritious because of human intervention. Uh, tomatoes grow wild as vines on the forest floor. Um, small berries that don't taste so good uh, sometimes can even make you sick. But human intervention, most of it within the last 150 years, have created the abundance of different types and flavors that we see. In all of these cases, humans were the driver for the genetic modification of these species. And it was done in a way without any um, precision. It was done by selecting what tasted best, what would perform best, maybe what didn't make you sick or kill you. So this was the idea of breeding and selection. We've had some other ways in which, um, in which we've had a, uh, uh, in which selection and breeding has been done. Um, one type is called mutation breeding. This has been engaged over the last 50 years, where subjecting plant materials to radiation or chemicals would change the DNA in random ways. And once in a while, a very favorable trait would come from that. Mutation breeding has been completely acceptable. No critics, or very few critics, completely acceptable by organic production, um, no problems. And uh, this chart here is a really important one. It's real busy, so I'll walk you through it. Chemical uh, mutation breeding uh, is found in a number of different plants, including bananas, pears, uh, some apples, um, have been bred for important traits because of uh, human-induced damage to DNA. Uh, nobody knows how many mutations there are. Nobody's ever cared. Completely acceptable to most, most forms of cultivation and most consumers. Nobody wants a label. We can compare this against wide crosses across species barriers, which again, completely acceptable. To take two plants, one from a mountain, one from a beach, that never would have made it naturally, 
that humans make that cross. Sometimes mixing as many of hundreds of thousands of genes in unpredictable and unforeseen ways. Nobody really seems to care. Nobody wants a label. Nobody really is worried about that kind of technology. But instead of adding 100,000 genes in ways we can't predict, if we add one gene in a way that we understand, a gene that we understand, that we can trace, that somehow is, is forbidden. And that's something that's looked upon as uh, problematic. And this is what I always refer to as the Franken-food paradox, that we're doing less, uh, less changes genetically, fewer changes genetically, and we know exactly what they do. We can tell you where they are in the genome and, and how they're performing. But somehow, this is the most scorned type of, of technology in genetic modification. Uh, I'm, I'm going to step my, skip my video for obvious reasons, but I'll move a... <laughs> But this sums it up pretty well. Uh, the movie Genetic Roulette, and I really wanted to show it because I really wanted Jeffrey Smith's words to be heard here from him. Um, I really wish that he were here, and I really look forward to meeting him in the future. But the, the video starts out with ominous tones, saying Americans are sick and getting sicker, and at the same time, there's been this new kind of food right under your nose. And the video goes ahead and says that, gen that genetic engineering is basically responsible for every single human health ailment, um, from allergies, autism, um, all kinds of cancers. Um, and uh, all of this is, is very heavily supported just by saying, look, it, it's happening at the same time. The graph down here is from, uh, some of, uh, from one of Smith's documents that shows the inflammatory bowel disease before GMOs and after GMOs. And what you might notice is that the rate doesn't change, although he finds this, uh, this type of uh, data very compelling. And this is a problem across the board. Uh, this is a slide that shows Robin O'Brien and uh, has, a, has a, um, a talk by her and uh, Charles, uh, Charles Benbrook. Uh, Robin's wonderful. Um, she runs an uh, allergy website, um, very concerned about allergies in children. Um, and, and quality food and quality nutrition, and I really commend her for that. Um, Benbrook has a very excellent CV and an excellent background, but I think they start to fall off a little bit here when they confuse correlation with causality. They're saying because allergies are increasing, because autism is increasing, because ADHD, asthma, and a plethora of other conditions are increasing, it must be due to GMO food. And that kind of thinking is just flawed, but it's prevalent throughout all of the uh, anti-biotech literature and anti-biotech positions. One I like to show is a correlation between organic food sales and autism. Now, it shows that the two have exactly the same kind of, uh, same kind of uh, um, growth over the last decade. Now, does that mean that organic food causes autism? Absolutely not. But it's the same kind of correlations that others are relying as, on as hard data and proof that there's some sort of mechanistic link between the disease and the technology that just hasn't been established by science. This also comes from Genetic Roulette, where, uh, where basically Smith talks about all of these disorders which are caused by transgenic technologies. So I'd like to change gears a little bit here and talk about a little bit more of how this applies to health. And I'll show a slide that many of you have recognized. The link to cancers. Last September, this slide exploded throughout the anti-GM universe. And it was a slide that's showing these grotesque misshapen rats, um, probably, well, we won't get into that, but, but three rats which were either fed GMO, GMO plus Roundup, or Roundup. And the, uh, the first thing that this should tip, you off at, tip me off as a scientist is that it says GMO. It doesn't say what the gene is. It uses the colloquial term, the familiar term that the casual reader might see and find offensive. This was all over signs at protests. You see it all over anti-GM websites. But what did they leave off of this panel of lumpy mice or lumpy rats? How about a control? What about the one that just ate corn? Well, it turns out that if you look carefully at the data, they got cancer too. But the authors and the reviewers chose to not show that data. Another, but this data did continue to catch on. This comes from one of Smith's, uh, Smith's um, publications. Uh, all kinds of headlines. This one's great. Cancer row over at GM Foods shows that it did this to rats and caused cause, uh, organ damage and early death in humans. The paper did not barely show the first thing, and they're saying that this extends to humans. And new proof, which it hardly was proof at all. But it is proof 
of how the anti-GMO uh, how the anti-GMO factions use fear to drive their message rather than hard science. Another good one was the uh, um, presence of BT, which is the uh, um, the uh, anti-insect protein in the umbilical cords and in mothers um, in Canada. These data are really interesting too. So if you go back to their paper and use their own techniques, their own, their own assay, what we do when we do this kind of assay to detect is BT there, is we make a curve where we spike in X amount first to understand our levels of detection. These come from exactly from their data. This is the level of detection, just saying if you put in X amount, you get out X amount. These are their data. And it was either not detected or, oops, I'll go back one. It was either not detected or somewhere detected at extremely low levels. Their data are in the noise. They don't say that, there's, um, that this is detected in umbilical cords, yet that is what the authors say. And that is what people run with. Again, uh, this link that, there, that there's uh, GMO uh, toxins in 93% of unborn babies, um, that it's in umbilical cords. The data did not show this, yet this is what the popular anti-biotech press runs with. And I like that one. The last thing I'll talk about here are just a couple of mechanisms in the way that this works. Because I think as an educator, when we can look into the black box and understand how it works, we fear it less. And so I show this today just so you have an idea of how simple and elegant these mechanisms are and the way in which they, um, a way that which you can communicate them about them to uh, effectively teach to bring less fear. BT works by, and it, this shows a caterpillar that's chewing on BT crystals. What happens is that these crystals, once inside the, uh, inside the, the larval insect, are processed by a specific enzyme in the gut of the, of the uh, larvae. Once they're processed, they become active, they bind to a specific receptor inside the gut of the larval organism that creates a pore, which causes the contents of the gut to mix with the contents of the body cavity. This is how it kills it. You don't have the ability to process that toxin, that protein, that, to that, that entity that's toxic to the, to the insect. You also don't have the receptors, and your stomach can't get the same kind of pores that this does, that it does in an insect. It can't affect you. It's an elegant mechanism. The, I show it here on the leaf as a, as a powder rather than uh, coming out of the, um, being produced by the leaf, because this is how it's used in organic culture. It's been used for over 50 years at least, and it works wonderfully. Many advantages to BT, including massively less in, uh, insecticide use. I'll talk briefly about Roundup Ready products. This is where a gene is inserted into the genome that makes, the, makes a plant resistant to the chemical glyphosate. And this slide shows uh, glyphosate-sensitive corn grown in a field of glyphosate-tolerant corn. Again, the mechanism is wonderfully elegant. In a conventional hybrid, at the bottom of the slide, it shows the outputs of this biochemical pathway couple of amino acids, which are the building blocks of proteins. If you have glyphosate, it binds a critical step, critical enzymatic step that blocks the production of those amino acids, and the plant dies. Very simple, one step. In a, in a glyphosate-resistant plant, there's a modified part of this enzyme. So that little Pac-Man won't take a triangle. He needs a square. A triangle just doesn't fit in there. In this case, the plant lives just fine. And this is a very simple, very effective mechanism of making a plant that's resistant to the herbicide. The benefits are that it's very well understood. It's not as bad of a, a herbicide as a previously used ones. Uh, of course, there's limitations that you can create weeds which are resistant, and that's a problem, but a problem that can have other solutions. There also have been some documented effects on water ecology, and these are, these are not specific to glyphosate, but occur in, uh, with any of the agricultural pesticides, including rotenone, which is acceptable for organic culture. So I'll conclude with this, that we really need you to be a critical evaluator of the claims made by antibiotech interests, mm -hmm. that you need to understand the mechanisms that attach correlations to causality. You need to understand the biology and ask what independent scientists, like me, say. Um, where's the work published? Is it published? Does the work expand, or is it a dead end? Is it something that, that other labs are seeing this amazing result and then continuing with their own studies? Or are these simply uh, findings that occur one time flash in a pan that disappear into the rear view mirror of time because they just simply didn't pan out. The last thing I always like to say is that whether it's policy or whether it's what your own personal beliefs are, you don't make a decision based on fear. 
You make it on evidence, and you make it using science. Fear is everywhere, and it's, it's pervasive in, in the anti-biotech movement. But what's more important is that you can get good information. Biofortified, the National Academies of Science, uh, professional associations for plant biologists, uh, all of these have really good information that is independent and can provide you with good guidance on this. And my, G my uh, email account is up, uh, email information is up there. I urge you, if you ever have questions, please contact me. I spend a lot of time answering emails uh, and answering, uh, answering questions from everybody. So I'll conclude there. Um, I look forward to your questions after this session. Um, and after that, we'll turn over to Carl um, after his introduction. Yes. Uh, oh, by the way, I, I noticed that uh, genetically modified foods weren't blamed for global warming. <laughs> What's wrong with the opposition here? Uh, Carl Haro von Mogel uh, is a plant biotechnologist. He's the chair of Biology Fortified, uh, an independent nonprofit that seeks to improve the public dialogue about genetic engineering and sustainability in agriculture. He co-edits the BioFortified blog, which has become a popular hub for geneticists and science communicators. BioFortified has pioneered the genetic engineering risk atlas database, known as Genera, which catalogs over 600 peer-reviewed studies on the risks of GE crops and foods. He's currently competing his completing his PhD in plant breeding and plant genetics at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, a fine institution, I might add, focusing on flavor and nutrition genes. Uh, and on genes that affect sugar and starch and sweet corn. Uh, and this is one of the more interesting aspects of, of breeding. It took a long, long time for people to conventionally breed uh, from what is known as the SU gene, the sweet corn gene, which allows it to mature slower and therefore be edible for a long time by people, uh, incorporating what are called the SH2 genes, which are sugary enhancer genes that keep sugar for a long time. That took uh, decades and decades, and we want people to eat you know, a lot of people want to eat more vegetables. Well, if they're inedible, they're not going to eat them. Now we can incorporate these things probably a lot quicker over time, and that's what he's working on, which is fantastic. Anyway, Carl. So how do I pull this up? Oh, there we are. Never mind, I don't have to do anything. Wow, technology is great. Uh, so uh, th thank you very much. I'm very delighted to be here. Uh, I uh, found out on Thursday that they needed a third person and so immediately grabbed a, uh, a, a, f a flight to get here last night so I could participate in this. I'm very uh, glad to be a part of it. So um, a little bit about myself. Uh, yeah, so as, uh, as was mentioned, I work on uh, genes in sweet corn. Um, I have to correct a little bit of information about uh, the genes that were just mentioned. Uh, you mentioned uh, SH2 shrunken to is a super sweet sweet corn um, that's uh, different from sugar enhanced SE sweet corn, which is the gene that I'm studying. And uh, uh, you'll get to find out where that is uh, once we get the paper published later this year. Uh, but basically, I'm a, I'm a gene hunter. I'm trying to find where, uh, where in the DNA of an organism a particular trait comes from. And sometimes it takes a long time. The, the, the experimental lines of corn used to track that trait were started when I was about this high. Uh, I was in, uh, uh, I think, uh, fourth grade when the first initial cross was made. I had no idea I was going to work on uh, anything related to plants. And then, and then eventually it ends up in my hands when I went to grad school. So I'm assuming this button or that one. Aha. Uh -huh. So um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about uh, uh, the blog that myself and uh, my uh, uh, colleague uh, Anastasia Bodnar um, up in the top right uh, started. We called it the Biofortified blog. And we were starting to blog about uh, uh, genetically engineered crops and agriculture and sustainability and organic farming, things like that. And uh, there wasn't really much of a discussion going on. There's just a couple of blogs here or there, and uh, a lot of discussion in, uh, sci in the science blogosphere on other topics, but not on this. And so we thought, well, why don't we make a group blog and get all the discussion in one place? Because we're all busy people. She was a grad student at the time. She's already graduated. She made it out first um, at Iowa State. And um, a uh, former professor of mine, Pam Ronald at UC Davis, and uh, David Tribe, a professor at the University of Melbourne in Australia, uh, we all came together and made this group blog. And then since then, we incorporated as a nonprofit organization called Biology Fortified. And still waiting to hear back from the IRS about tax exemption, but we're getting there. And uh, well, we only just submitted it about a month ago, so. <laughs> so um, 
uh, uh, some of the things we talk about, we talk about ag, we talk about uh, biotechnology. A lot of the stuff we do is, you know, when claims uh, roll around, we just go, well, what does the scientific literature say? And uh, we try to bring people to that science and make it a civil place where people can talk about it. Because honestly, there are not a lot of civil places to talk about this topic on the internet. And it's really difficult um, to get a conversation going when people just start yelling at each other. And uh, you know, one of the things that uh, you know was mentioned several times already today, and probably will come up again, is you know the the two camps of like GMOs and organic, and we actually don't even think that those two are even natural enemies. It's kind of an artificial debate between the two. When one is about farming practices, the other one is about creating new traits. There's no reason outside of uh, politics or ideology why you can't grow some new trait that you gener generate with genetic engineering in an organic farm, except for the certification process. That's a different thing. So uh, one of the things we do to try to uh, uh, make the topic more approachable is we have our, uh, our blog mascot, um, uh, Frank and Food, your, who's your friendly neighborhood genetically modified organism, uh, which uh, anybody who's present here today can get their photo with him and be added to our extensive uh, photo album on the blog. So uh, the two things I'm going to talk about are about just how much research there is out there about these crops and how we can get more information to people. And then also some of the actual crops themselves that aren't yet out but exist. So um, uh, the claim goes around that there's really no independent science. And uh, you saw this uh, same girl earlier in another photo today. Um, she, her picture's been uh, running around uh, the internet a lot. And she says, I am not a science experiment. And it sort of galvanized a lot of people. And there's been a lot of imitations of that. And the perception is that if you uh, are eating uh, GMOs, that you're part of a grand scientific experiment. They say that they're risky, that they're untested experiments, and that there's no independent science. But the reality is that there actually is a lot of independent science. There are, um, there are literally hundreds of uh, papers, perhaps even over 1,000 papers, um, that were just trying to scour the literature to get them all together in one place, which I'll talk about in a little bit. And um, you know, a lot of people say, like, why should we trust any data that's produced by a company that has a profit motive? You know, why trust any data produced by Monsanto or Syngenta, Pioneer, et cetera? Because it, they would have a reason to give you, you know, to make things up, right? Because they're trying to make a buck. But at the same time, uh, we have. Uh, uh, we have a lot of independent studies that don't disagree at all from the studies being produced by the companies. If there was such a disagreement, then we'd be like, yeah, there's a reason to distrust that. But since we're finding the two coming to the same conclusion, then there is a reason to trust that. Only to a point, of course. But uh, oh, I actually wanted to say, um, I totally agree with her. She is not a science experiment, because the science, for a large part, has been done. Uh, it's more, as, more of a social science experiment about how humans interact with this technology. So um, I'll go over this a little uh, uh, quickly because we've already had some, some quotes from organizations. But um, uh, there was a, a report that came out a few years ago called The Decade of EU-Funded GMO Research. And they had like hundreds of, uh, of, uh, of projects and uh, even hundreds and hundreds more of uh, labs and researchers. And they concluded from their research in Europe, where you know, gen genetic engineering is not too popular, that biotechnology, in particular GMOs, are not per se more risky than conventional plant breeding technologies. And then, uh, oh, a little problem with the trailing S up there. But um, in the National Academy of Science, uh, Sciences, they, um, they, publish, uh, they publish several reports, which you can look up. Um, there's one on pest protected plants. To that from the year 2000. A really good one from 2004, the Safety of Genetically Engineered Foods. They're very readable. Um, there's uh, also one on genetically engineered crops and farm sustainability from 2010. And the general conclusion from all of this is that there are real tangible benefits. Um, and, but there are also some drawbacks, you know, like if you are uh, using like a, an herbicide tolerant crop, crop and you spray the same herbicide year after year, you're going to get resistance to it. And that's the same thing whether you're using genetically engineered crops or not. Uh, so really the, the way the risk and the benefits work out, it just depends upon the trade itself more than the method used to produce it and then how we use, manage, and regulate it. So uh, this has uh, been mentioned as a little project that we started on our blog. It sort of started as a list. It was just people say, where's the science? And so we just started gathering it and sticking it into a list. And uh, then a couple years ago, we were like, you know, we really want to make this a database. And uh, so this is a project that's ongoing right now. Uh, we have uh, now over 600 peer-reviewed studies listed. And you can go 
to our site and click on the tab, Genera, the Genetic Engineering Risk Atlas at the top, and you can go and pour through the list. And if you want to pull out study, uh, studies, you can. Uh, but what we're working on this summer, and it should be live later this, uh, this summer, is to actually make it searchable. So if you want to find something on a particular crop or from a particular com uh, country, um, categor uh, categorized in all sorts of different ways that you'd be able to pull them out. And then also to rate their outcomes. What was the outcome of the research? Um, because there are some that say that uh, there's a problem. And then there's also a whole bunch that say that there isn't. So it's only when we can put all these things together that we can actually get a bigger picture from it. Because you can't cherry pick your way through science. And we got a grant from the American Society of Plant Biologists to, uh, uh, to work on this project. So, uh, so now I'm going to switch to talking about uh, the brave new world of GMOs. Uh, um, you know, you've seen a lot of these kinds of pictures. Uh, Greenpeace made some excellent ones here where they show uh, scorpion carrots and spider green onions. There is a fishy corn car that drives around campaigning for genetic, uh, genetic engineering labeling. You got grenade corn and uh, um, uh, a new one um, uh, pro uh, used in protests against uh, genetically engineered apple have uh, little sort of TIE fighter like monsters uh, with uh, DNA for jaws. And you know, they paint a very scary picture. Now, they're, they're trying to capture through art what genetic engineering is and what it means. And I really think that uh, it's kind of run into a dead end because we're seeing the same sort of patterns over and over again. What I want to do is I want to show you what uh, sort of traits there actually are but aren't grown on uh, farms yet. So, uh, so you've heard about BT, you've heard about herbicide tolerance. There's things like virus-resistant papayas um, and squash that aren't very widely grown, but they are out there and approved for growing. Um, but there are a whole bunch more that are plants that exist that, uh, that aren't being grown yet. So the claim runs around that genetically engineered crops don't increase yields. They don't increase them a whole lot, but uh, they do on the farm when it comes to like a BT corn or cotton when it's protected from insects. They do actually get a little bump in yield because not so many insects munching on them. But the, um, it is said that, uh, that the in genetically engineered crops don't increase intrinsic yield, which is a scientific term for how much the plant would produce on its own if nothing was attacking it. And so um, I wanted to point out here a couple of snapshots from conferences I've gone to. Uh, where you have uh, corn that produces more um, kernels per row, um, per, uh, per ear, and uh, with, uh, with adding the, uh, the trans gene, the, the gene that is engineered into the, into the plant. And then on the right, um, you can also see, uh, it's a little difficult to see, but the plants on the left have a uh, trait that makes the, the soybean plants uh, bigger and yield, I think, around 10% more, developed by a company in the, the uh, southern uh, end of the San Francisco Bay called Mendel Biotechnology. And so these are in testing right now. They're not on farms for production, but they actually do make the plants yield more on their own. The, this is actually out, um, uh, I think, and it's, uh, it's pretty new, and it's uh, a trait developed by Monsanto where, they, um, uh, where the corn is able to resist moderate droughts. This is, you know, it might think be particularly important after a year like last year. Now that was a severe drought, so this may not hold up quite so well just like any plant just would die in such a severe drought. But when you have moderate drought and it happens at flowering time, you can lose quite a bit. And uh, so uh, Frank is hanging out with some rice plants in Thailand right there. Um, there are uh, salt tolerant varieties of rice that exist and are being worked on. There's salt tolerance being worked on in wheat. If you, um, if you uh, irrigate with, um, let's say, uh, you know, lower quality water that's got stuff dissolved in it and it dries, you start to build up salt in the soil and plants don't like that. Well, so there are plants that uh, people are working on that, that like that. There are black beans down in Brazil. This is a pretty cool project where they have uh, black beans that are resistant to a major virus that uh, is attacking uh, the, uh, the black bean plants. You can see the plants in the top are looking pretty good, and the plants in the bottom are looking pretty bad. Um, the plants in the bottom are the ones that are not resistant. And I think these are going through the regulatory process right now in Brazil. Uh, so uh, what you're looking at is some canola oil and some canola flowers. Um, 
there are uh, traits being worked on for canola and other crops that uh, involve what's called nitrogen use efficiency. So we have to spray uh, in one form or another uh, nitrogen uh, um, on, on crops, whether you're using, using like manure or using a fertilizer, uh, so plants can make proteins and, uh, and grow and yield a whole lot. But a lot of that can leach into the soil and the groundwater and the rivers, and so the goal is to try to make the plants better at absorbing it. And so this is a trait um, um, that uh, exists and has been tested and is being work, uh, incorporated into crops such as canola. So there are all kinds of nutritional traits that are being worked on. There is uh, a project down in St. Louis, Missouri, um, at the Donald Danforth Plant Science Center working on, thank you, working on uh, cassava. Cassava is a major staple crop in uh, Africa, particularly in times of drought and famine. And uh, the, it's not very nutritious. So this project involves putting uh, uh, genes that create beta carotene for making vitamin A. It involves uh, increasing the amount of iron, increasing the amount of zinc, increasing the uh, amount of protein, and decreasing the amount of poison in the, uh, the roots. The roots of cassava actually produce a, a poison, it actually makes something uh, called cyanogenic glycoside. It produces cyanide when you break open the plant. What they figured out how to do is to just turn that, uh, turn that stuff into more protein in the root. Uh, there's uh, projects to increase the amount of calcium in carrots and lettuce uh, that have been published, and these plants also exist. And they found that in, in people or in mice, that uh, people were able to absorb more calcium, a little bit more, something like 30%, but that's still something. If we're trying to get more nutrients in our diet, changes in genetics could help with that. Also changes in how we grow stuff. It's not one thing or the other. And uh, then uh, everybody's heard of golden rice, uh, a project uh, to make uh, a rice that produces uh, beta carotene in the grain. It's a major staple crop in Asia, and there are untold millions of uh, people who are deficient in vitamin A and who eat little more than rice uh, during the day because of, uh, uh, in their typical day because of uh, in, we're living in impoverished conditions. And uh, this is being tested right now in, uh, uh, I think, in field trials in the Philippines, and perhaps it might be introduced there in the next few years, but uh, every year it seems like it's going to be a couple of years away. And this has been fiercely opposed, but it's also been shown to um, uh, be bioavailable and it's been bred into local varieties, and you can learn, learn more about it on the Golden Rice website. This one is something I don't think many people have really heard about, edible cotton seed. Cotton seeds uh, have a compound called gossypol, which is poisonous to us. Um, some ruminant animals can eat it, but uh, there uh, is a project that involved uh, genetically engineering cotton seed to no longer produce that poison. And what this does is it opens up a completely new food that we haven't been able to eat before if this sort of thing is released. The amount of cotton seed estimates are if uh, could uh, produce enough protein for 500 billion people. No, sorry, million. Bleh. <laughs> million. <laughs> I'm going to be misquoted all over the place on that. So 500 million people. Um, and, uh, 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 and I'm, uh, I heard that they taste like chickpeas, but I, I don't know. So, I mean, th these are kinds of things when people talk about, like, you know, genetic engineering can't do very much. It can actually do all kinds of things. Um, but it takes really time and research and, uh, you know, a willing and open discussion. There are medicines based on plants. These are vats of, of carrot cells that produce an enzyme that can treat a disease called Goucher's disease. And that's actually been, uh, been approved. And people can actually just drink, like, this culture of carrots, uh, the carrot cells. And uh, they don't grow them as plants, just as cultured cells, and get a treatment for that. There are plant-based vaccines. There's a guy named uh, Charles Arnson at Arizona State University working on producing vaccines in tomatoes uh, or in tobacco and, and things like bananas, where you just eat that plant, and then you can get a vaccine against uh, a debilitating disease. Uh, there are projects working on preventing allergies. My dad is wheat gluten intolerant. I just heard a report uh, a couple of weeks ago that there's a group that's testing out um, a variety of wheat in Europe that might uh, end up uh, uh, producing a uh, sort of a gluten-free wheat that people with celiac disease might be able to eat. We'll see if that pans out. Who knows? There's uh, even more curious. There's rice that uh, what you're looking at the top right is uh, a cloud of pollen from Japanese cedar 
There are a lot of people in Japan who I think like 20% of people have severe allergic reactions to this, this tree pollen. And there was a group in Japan that decided, well, let's see if we can put something in, in a rice plant that would uh, essentially uh, uh, prepare their immune systems for this uh, cedar pollen. And they found that if people ate a bowl of this rice, that their allergies to the cedar pollen were reduced. Well, I'd never heard of something like that before, but apparently you can. Soybeans that make omega-3 fatty acids. Uh, I think Monsanto has uh, this trait, and they're working on uh, uh, releasing this sometime soon. I don't know when. This one's really cool. Uh, purple tomatoes. Tomatoes that produce anthocyanins, like what you find in blueberries or uh, in cranberries, um, things like that. Uh, where uh, there was a paper that just came out in the last week where they found that not only do the tomatoes last longer, uh, when they have this gene and have the anthocyanins in the fruit, but they also apparently taste better. And uh, if the anthocyanins, which are anti antioxidants, um, if the research pans out on whether or not those affect our health, they might help us last a little longer too. Uh, there are non-browning apples, an apple called Arctic Apple. A, a small company in Canada is working on this, and they're, uh, they're going through reg the regulatory process in the US and, uh, and also Canada right now. And, uh, uh, and this is pretty cool. They silence, it's just an enzyme. They silence an enzyme that reacts with uh, some of the uh, polyphenols, the, uh, some of the nutrients inside the apple, and it produces that displeasing brown color. It's not dangerous to eat, but you know, there are lots of kids, maybe some of you have some, who, when they look at a brown apple, want to just throw it out. So you can't really pre-slice an apple and send it to school with them, nor can you send a knife with them to school. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, uh, so, so imagine if you could slice it up and then send it with them uh, to school. Maybe they might eat their apples and not reach for some chips. Uh, they're going through the regulatory process right now is a potato made by an Idaho company um, called Simplot, and they did the exact same thing. They made a potato that doesn't brown when you slice it open. And then also has some other uh, characteristics where it doesn't produce as much uh, what's called acrylamide, which is a neurotoxin produced in very small amounts when you fry starches at high temperatures and oils. And so they just went in and knocked out what, um, uh, what, uh, what causes that. And uh, I mean, these, you know, you, I can just keep going. I, have to, I think I have to hurry this up, but there's late blight resistant potatoes. Uh, there is a, a salmon that grows uh, to market weight faster. And uh, the one animal here amongst the group. Animal biotech is a little behind all the plants, but, uh, but it's still coming along. And then there's things like wheat in Australia that um, produces more of the uh, long chain starch called amylose on the left and less of the short, uh, short branch stuff on the right and would have a lower glycemic index. So what that means is you eat it, you don't get all that sugar rushing into your blood so fast. It slow, comes more slowly. Uh, well, actually, Greenpeace broke into CSIRO's facility a few years ago and mowed it down, and they were very proud of themselves. They videotaped it. And it turns out that uh, Greenpeace ended up uh, paying a hefty fine of several hundred thousand dollars and, and, uh, uh, to, replay, uh, to, to fix the damage they caused. And I like to think of the fact that uh, now Greenpeace's money is now de, de facto funding genetic engineering research. So uh, then, uh, then finally, um, maybe a little bit of a, 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 a nicer tale is um, there was a, a variety of uh, wheat being developed at uh, the Rothamsted Research Station in, uh, in England that uh, instead of trying to kill insects or uh, prevent, uh, make a plant tolerant to herbicides or things like that, instead they decided they're going to try to scare away the insects with a pheromone that the insects use to tell each other that there are predators around. And so the wheat is now telling the aphids, uh, this wheat would tell the aphids, there's a predator around, keep away. And so while they were doing the field trial, they started to receive uh, uh, ominous threats from a group that was going to say, either rip it out or we will. And it got a huge amount of public attention. And uh, there, there's the protest right there where they were planning to go rip it out, but it turns out that they didn't end up ripping it out. It seems that maybe in some respects, the, uh, the way that people approach this topic has changed. And uh, hopefully for the better. Oh, no, no, here's, here's my last one. OK. So the American chestnut. Um, I don't know if anybody here has been to an American chestnut forest, but they apparently used to be very widespread. And uh, really fantastic trees, lots of poetry, lots of things written about them. But there was a fungal disease that was introduced from Asia that uh, almost completely wiped out these trees. And uh, there have been breeding efforts that have had some success, but there's also a genetically engineered American chestnut tree that is resistant to 
the fungal pathogen that uh, destroys it. And they're, they're now opening up this discussion about not let's grow this on a farm, but let's release this to make a forest. I mean, it seems like a ju juxtaposition, something like a technology like ge genetic engineering restoring like a, n a natural native forest. But this, I think that's kind of sort of the, the weirdness of how we approach this topic as human beings, but also just um, the cool stuff uh, that, uh, that, that, is, that is possible. And I think we need to really open up the discussion to talk about these kinds of things, because all of them are different. All these different traits I threw up there, um, you know, this big laundry list, they all have to be approached in a totally different way from each other. They all have different risks and benefits. They all have different uh, potentials and, uh, uh, for good and potentials for bad. And uh, so with that, I'd just like to, uh, to suggest for people who are on, uh, uh, discussing this on Twitter, um, is to put out there, like, what do you want your plants to do? What do you want your food to do? You know, just come, you know, tap into your own creativity and uh, put it up on the Twitter hashtag, GMO Forum. Put it up in our forum on biofortify.org, and uh, let's see if, uh, you know, people can come up with some interesting creative ideas. Anyways, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah. Imagine John Antine, he's a television producer for NBC uh, and ABC, correct? Imagine if we're going to make him a radio producer <laughs> and that he doesn't have a, uh, a, any video to show us. Uh, so do you think you can possibly I think describe we, what we, happened we in India? Discuss it for a few minutes, <laughs> and then we'll go to the Q&A. Thank you. We wanted to do a, um, a, a very short case study. I was going to show a three-minute clip from Genetic Roulette, uh, uh, the Jeffrey Smith documentary that talked about, um, in, in, in very scary terms, what is generally referred to as the Indian BT cotton catastrophe. Uh, BT cotton was introduced in India in the, um, in, the, in the, I guess around the year 2000, if I'm not mistaken. 2002. 2002. Um, and um, if you see Jeffrey Smith's documentary, if you go on literally hundreds of websites, oh, it will run. Oh, yes. okay, oh my god. Ooh. Can we put up the right, uh, the right PowerPoint? He has the wrong PowerPoint up there. Oh, OK. I don't see it on my, um, there we go. We're getting this. Right? Monsanto talks about uh, we'll, we'll play this. This is their PR concoction. Let's take a look at what's happening in India. They took over the cottonseed industry and are forcing millions of farmers to plant their BT cotton. Now, cotton is engineered to produce an insecticide which breaks open the stomach of insects and kills them. The normal natural BT is found in soil bacteria. When that's used as a spray in the Pacific Northwest, for example, for gypsy moths, about 500 people complained of allergic and flu-like symptoms. Some had to go to the hospital. Now, in India, thousands of workers are complaining of the same symptoms. Many are getting rashes and many are itching. Farmers have been complaining that they have itching. When they grow, they, they go to pluck, they have an itching sensation. In this place, they have a lot of pain. They have a lot of pain. They have a lot of allergies. They have a lot of pain. They have a lot of pain. They have a lot of allergies. In India, they allow animals to graze on the cotton plants after harvest. They have no problem for years. When they introduced BT cotton, however, they noticed that thousands of animals got sick and thousands died. There's a small organization called Deccan Development Society that pleaded with the government to do tests on the BT cotton to see if it was causing the animal deaths. They went to the government, they didn't follow through. They went to universities, they didn't do anything. So DDS did the study itself. They took nine sheep. Six were eating either Bolgard 1 or Bolgard 2 BT cotton, three non-GMO cotton plants. So within a month, all the animals which ate on Bolgard 1, Bolgard 2, they died. And the animals which ate on non-BT, non pestle managed cotton are still alive and are still active. I visited a village in Andhra Pradesh. They had allowed their buffalo to graze on cotton plants after harvest for years without a problem. They allowed their 13 buffalo to graze on BT cotton plants for a single day. Within three days, all 13 buffalo were dead. We know that the crops that are genetically engineered have unpredicted side effects. This can not only affect health, but also the agronomic properties. 
The BT cotton grown in India is extremely unreliable. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But there they have no safety net. Millions of farmers have invested money in the more expensive seeds and associated chemicals. Many have borrowed heavily at high interests. When the cotton doesn't work out, many of these farmers cannot even pay back their high interest loans. The number of farmer suicides as a result is astounding. High cost seed with unreliable performance is what is getting farmers into debt and debt is what is causing the farm suicides. All our studies over the last decade show that the suicides are concentrated in the cotton areas and in cotton, much higher suicides in the BT cotton belt. My assessment is 250,000 farm suicides in this country, of which at least three quarters is BT led. obviously a very um, horrific kind of claim um, and very scary kind of claim. Let's see, why is this not? Are you possibly a D? Oh, no. What? No, nothing. Can you move this? I don't know why this is not there. there. Okay. Well, I wanted to say very quickly about BT cotton. This is, we, we know the technology. It's been, it's been, it's been very well um, um, assessed. This is a cotton field that you can see where the BT cotton is grown on the, um, on the left and on the right. And normal cotton is grown um, in the center. And um, obviously the BT cotton has been very, um, uh, uh, does protect against a lot of things that would otherwise cause um, uh, problems in, 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 the, in the cotton fields. Now this is gone. Could we switch the, to the next slide? There. Uh, the National Academies has studied BT cotton and they claim that it is one of the most sustainable innovations in agriculture um, over the last decade. There's a strong correlation between the rising percentage of BT cotton acres planted over time and the decrease in pounds of active ingredient per planted acre. So we see it as a very sustainable technology. Um, again, can we change this, please? Uh, yet, if you go onto activist websites, uh, including naturalnews.com, this is just from um, a couple of years ago, Al Jazeera, this is just from um, uh, a month or two ago, seeds of suicide and slavery versus seeds of life and freedom. You see all these stories about the suppo suppo supposed allergies and the, and the suicide deaths. This is not something that's discussed di distantly in the past. It's something that's very omnipresent on the media, and you see it as a talking point in almost every anti-GMO um, website. If we could change the next one. Uh, what's so interesting about it is that, for some reason, I don't know what, what, uh, the f what's in the food in, the, um, in, in, in Great Britain, but Prince Charles seemed to have adopt adopted uh, Indian farmers as one of his pet um, projects. Uh, he blames GM crew, uh, crops for farmers' suicide. This has been obviously picked up by the world media. Um, when celebrities endorse these kinds of things, we saw this in the, um, in the, in the uh, anti-vaccine movement when um, uh, various Hollywood celebrities promoted this kind of anti-science thing. It obviously resonates with people. So when Prince Charles says this, it gets a lot of coverage and becomes extremely dangerous. Next slide. Next slide. That was the documentary. Um, if, if you actually, you, you see these claims about various things. You see the claims about um, reactions to BT cotton, for instance. What, you, what was not clear by that documentary, um, the, 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 the slide that they showed of people having um, allergic reactions, those are people from organic farms that were sprayed with BT cotton. Those are organic farms that sprayed BT cotton because, B, uh, that's, that sprayed the BT because BT is used in organic farming. It's a very common technique used and um, there's nothing different between what's used in organic farms except that it's genetically engineered into the plants. Um, but if you look at the study that um, uh, Jeffrey Smith bases his comments on, it's in his book, he's got a book. That book is widely cited on anti-GMO websites and you source out what the study is. It all goes back to a report written not by a scientist but by an activist named Ashish Gupta, an activist um, who spent the last 12 years, this is written in 2005, associated with an anti-GMO um, uh, activist movement. So all these stories are generated from an original report written by not a scientist but an activist that's then picked up and it metastasizes ac across the internet. One of the other major claims, if we could switch the slide, 
Uh, the cheap deaths are related to BT cotton. What's the source of that besides a, um, obviously, a very unscientific test um, uh, demonstrated there? It goes back to a so-called study on GM Watch, which is, which is an anti-GM website. There aren't science studies that show this. It's really basically claims by anti-biotech um, websites. Next. Um, Farmer suicides related to BT cotton. There have been a number of studies on this. Um, the India farm suicides is not something new. As you can see by this chart, it predates uh, biotech, the introduction of biotech, which happened in 2002. In fact, there's been a slight reduction in suicides. It's really related to other problems, and it's the, um, as we will discuss in, among the group of us, it is an attempt to reposition an ongoing problem, an agricultural problem related to poverty and a number of other issues, and, and, and trying to fo focus that issue on um, farmer suicides. Um, but despite the recent media hype around farmer suicides, um, fueled by civil society organizations, uh, are reaching the, and reaching the highest political spheres in India and elsewhere, there is no evidence in available data of a resurgence of farmer suicide in India. I want to talk to Kevin and ask you, Kevin, could you discuss what the evidence shows, what's going on in India right now, and, and really give us some context to, um, to this India suicide story and the agricultural problems that exist in India might have led to that? Well, it ties in with the agricultural problems, but it's really a socioeconomic complexity. Uh, there's many different uh, problems in India that are leading to suicides, and particularly not so much, there's more than, uh, there's half the number of farmer deaths as there are to others who are committing suicide. Mostly a large amount of young women between the ages, I think the survey said between 19 and 25, a tremendous spike in suicides um, for ma many reasons. Um, but, the, but the overall problem that's occurred with respect to, uh, with respect to the, the cotton issue is because it's a very, very risky crop to grow. And it's a gamble for anyone to do it because it's substantial money if you do get it to grow. But you're growing in very difficult soils and you're dependent upon monsoons. And if you don't get monsoonal rain, you don't have a crop. And it doesn't matter whether you have genetically modified BT cotton or, or other types of hybrids. No rain, no seeds, no profit. And this is where, this is some of the problems. Is it maybe in a, a changing climate, problems that you're seeing with drier spells for them uh, that are much more of a problem than, uh, than a biotech company that sold them seeds. Uh, Carl, some of your reflections on some of these studies that, that supposedly show horrible problems with BT cotton? Yeah, I'd actually like to address the claim about sheep dying uh, from eating the uh, the cotton, one thing that uh, a lot of the groups uh, claim. There's actually a, a study that's, I think, number 13 on our list that's published on our website uh, in, the, in the, our genera list that actually is an experiment feeding sheep BT and non-BT cotton, and there weren't any problems with them. So there is actually science on that. And so I just, you know, have to wonder what the methods were and what they were actually, you know, doing with the, you know, with the sheep over there at their that, that was the actual cause. There can be m many things. There can be uh, so something that was sprayed on the crop. There could be uh, uh, diseases. Uh, there could be uh, pathogens on, the, uh, on the, the crops that they were eating. And so they're just picking one, uh, one thing that we already know can't be the cause of that and then, uh, then blaming that. One final comment. I think you can, if you, if you reflect a second, the idea that uh, Monsanto has created a product that impoverishes farmers who buy it um, and prompts them to uh, commit massive suicides makes no sense on its surface. Um, there was a, a, a journalist actually wrote an article about this and, and Riley and sadly said, despite what anti-biotech activists may believe, companies, and that includes agribusinesses, I think prefer to keep their customers alive and prosperous. Um, it doesn't do any good to, to kill off your, um, your major customers. Um, with that, I think we'll um, go, go to both the audience and to, um, uh, Twitterville, Twitterland, uh, for a number of questions. Okay, is, it, is this Twitter? Uh, let's do audience first here, over there. Uh, name and organization, if you could. Uh, Dave Price, retired reporter. Uh, two questions, very quickly. One is, you've laid out the scientific uh, case for it. But I was wondering, obviously there's still a lot of opposition uh, to this. Could you switch hats for a minute, go to the opposing side, and kind of categorize, is most of this coming from an anti-science base, do you think, um, an anti-business base with Monsanto, some kind of religious scruples? That's the first question. Second question, obviously there are drawbacks, and this would, I'd like each person just to address this briefly. When you go to bed at night, what would concern you most as a drawback? And of course, you can also address how that could be resolved. 
Um, so I, I think the, uh, the, the major people who are uh, involved here are people who have a, a, a very good connection to media, who have very strong feelings about, uh, about the safety and security of their families, uh, people who really are concerned and people who really do care. But there's a certain, it's a very complicated topic and it's much easier to believe a website than it is to seek out a scientist. Um, I think that it was said once that they're creating products that satisfy low-income farmers that high-income people don't want. And I think that's really very telling. Um, the thing I stay up at night about the drawbacks of this technology is that someone's going to stand in the way of a technology that, that, that maybe they don't need, but someone else could really benefit from. Uh, I think that the, that the potential deployment of this to solve world problems is, or at least be part of that, is really important and uh, is something that I would like to see, um, I'd like to see that barrier not there. David, I think it's a, a very complex question. I think there's many aspects. I, I refer to what I call the naturalistic fallacy. For whatever reason, in the past 10, uh, 15 years, I think there's been a, a rise in, in technophobia, chemophobia, um, a general suspicion of technology that maybe we've gone too far. I don't think it's um, necessarily rooted in, in um, a rational view of, 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 of empirical data. I think it in infects the debate over energy resource extraction. You see it in the fracking debate. Not to say that there aren't controversial aspects to all these technologies, but there's almost a, and I hate to use the term knee jerk because it puts it in ideological terms, but there's this reaction against technology that there must be something wrong with it, combined with a general suspicion of corporations, since many of these products, um, including the most high profile biotech products, um, take hundreds of millions of dollars to develop because of a very high regulatory barrier. So it almost forces a situation where the only companies that can um, make their way through this regulatory gauntlet are the Monsanto sized companies of the world. So they become easy targets for a situation that was created because of the activist barriers helping to activist um, uh, protests creating high barriers to entry into the marketplace. Um, in terms of what I wake up at night worrying about, um, nothing involving biotechnology that I wouldn't also apply to any technological innovation. There's always going to be um, costs. There's always going to be um, um, imperfect uh, applications of technologies. Um, I guess in the case of biotechnology, we just don't see any indication that the problems that could conceivably result from that would be um, on the scale, even remotely on the scale, that I think the, um, uh, the anti-biotech activists suggest. Carl? Yeah, so a couple quick little things with regard to like where it comes from. I mean, whenever I uh, go onto a, a news page or on a blog post somewhere and leave a comment, the first thing that comes back is, oh, well, Monsanto must have paid you to say that. I sh actually should have said in my presentation, we don't accept any money from any private companies, organic, biotech, otherwise. And uh, I, I actually wish that the discussion was a little bit more than a noun, a verb in Monsanto. Um, it, uh, it really kind of just uh, makes it difficult for people to even approach the topic. I think a lot of it is about uh, uh, fears over what corporations are going to do. Some of it's anti-government. Some of it, um, is ide uh, uh, it is based on you know, what might be religious or pseudo-religious ideas. Um, and, uh, but then uh, the other, your other question about uh, like what keeps me up at night, I actually did have one thing that kept me up at night, and that was uh, when that protest was going to go to supposedly uh, rip out the Rotham said wheat trial. I had a really hard time getting to sleep because it was going to start I at like 3 a.m. or 4 a.m. or something in my time in Madison, and I wanted to find out what's going on on the ground. And so I had an un uneasy time getting to sleep because I was like, this is a fantastic sounding project. And we put up an interview with one of the scientists about it while this controversy was going on. And uh, I was worried that if something like that is ripped up and that um, researchers who have ideas like that feel that they can't even succeed, that it'd be a waste of their time and of grant money, that the debate would still just be about BT and Roundup Ready and Monsanto. Okay, um, I, by the way, uh, as a mode of protecting my territory uh, to blame climate change uh, on uh, issues with Indian um, uh, cotton would not work because there are no, there's no evidence for any systematic change in the monsoon. And in fact, the warmer you get it, the stronger the monsoon tends to be. Okay, we have a Twitter question. And then I'll go, go to, to, I'm going to ask the audience for something after the, this is an easy one. Can we do this one in 30 seconds or less? Everybody's going to give the same answer, I think. Shouldn't we have labeling? Uh, don't people have a right to know? Okay, more information is always better. But the only thing I fear is that once you label it, 
Now you have activists that are going to use that as a target. And we know that misinformation um, is pro promulgated. We know that, um, that we know that there's a lot of uh, misinformation that's given out. I've showed that on some slides. And I'm afraid that that's what would happen. I'd like to add something to that. So I'm open to, um, uh, to labels. I just haven't seen any labels that uh, I would find, you know, have more information and less uh, uh, sort of like costs and other drawbacks associated with it. Uh, because the, the fact is like corn and soy and things like that are all mixed together. So you either have to separate it out, which adds to the cost, or you have to basically label it all as may contain. And that really doesn't actually help people know what's in there, but it's, uh, again, could be a, used as a tool to worry. But I actually think that for those companies that develop uh, a trait that is a consumer trait, something like a more healthy uh, uh, a grain or vegetable, that they may want to even try just labeling it as we change this property. Actually, the FDA says they have to label that they change the nutritional content um, uh, if it's due to biotechnology and just actively label, we did it with this method. And uh, from what I understand of uh, the, the literature on consumer acceptance, the, the, uh, the opposition to things like that is not as great as I think they uh, think it is. Um, I, I would suggest that a, a couple of um, uh, responses. One, I think if we had a label modeled perhaps along the way we use tobacco products, it might be something we would consider. The tobacco label is the Surgeon General has determined this could be hazardous to your health. If we had a label that said the American Academy of Sciences has determined that genetically modified um, uh, products are safe, uh, uh, that might be something that we would, we would consider. In other words, if it actually conveyed information that was scientifically based, it would be something we would consider. Um, but, but I also think that if you look at the measures being considered, like the one in Washington, they're looking for what, what we call skull and crossbones labels, like a big patch on the front that's bigger than anything else. Um, there are some countries that have labeled uh, genetically modified ingredients as part, of a, um, uh, as, as part of an ingredients label. That is not part of the agenda of campaigners because they don't want it there. They're looking for something that's literally a huge scare thing that leaves open the question of are there some health hazards? So again, I think it goes back to what Kevin said. If there's a way to convey information that is actually scientifically based, that is vetted by science organizations, sure, we should be open for it. But the real answer to it is that we have the opportunity for um, optional um, uh, labeling. We have companies that can put non-GMOs on their products. If there is a market, if there is a need for that, if there is a desire, if there's a marketplace for that, we'll, we will see. Uh, Whole Foods says that they will move in that direction. If there's a market for that, non-mandatory labeling seems like an appropriate way to go. Okay, I, want, I would like the, well, one favor from the audience. Uh, is there anybody in the audience that can give a cogent anti-GMO type question so that we could, have, would that be you? Excellent, okay. First, let me preface this by saying that I'm pro-science. I think there's a, a big future in this down the road. Um, but since you were in journalism and since I'm a journalist also, let me direct this question toward Mr. Intine. I saw a clip on the internet involving uh, two award-winning reporters, Steve Wilson and Jane Aker, who investigated R RBG Milk. I'm uh, sorry, investigated? R RBG Milk. It was this Monsanto bovine gro growth hormone milk. Uh, they basically were told that they couldn't put this on the air. They had done extensive research on this. They found it to be dangerous. They found it to be harmful. And they were broadsided by these threatening letters from Monsanto attorneys in New York to the point where they were told they couldn't do it and then they had to go through 83 edits. Eventually they were fired. I found that kind of, kind of alarming. Um, I went, I, I took your advice and I sought out the advice of an independent scientist in Canada when I was there. I talked to a guy named Shiv Chopra who was a leading scientist at uh, Health Canada. And he knew something about R RBG milk because he was offered a million to two million dollar bribe by Monsanto to rubber stamp, stamp and fast track uh, RBG milk through the Canadian system. He went public with it. He wrote a book called Corrupt to the Core. And he described the, the, the so-called science at, at the FDA and other things as compromise. What, what's the, con could you go right to the question? Please? The question is this. With all this controversy and all this obfuscation, all this transparency and all this bribery that goes on in government at, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the form of campaign contributions, why can't people 
at least when 90% of the people, poll after poll shows, want labeling, why can't there be labeling? Why is it fought so vigorously? Well, I think we addressed the labeling issue. As for the other um, points that you, that you raised, to be honest, you just raise a- anecdotes. These are just accusations by a journalist, um, a book written by someone, non-sourced. Um, <laughs> I mean, if, if, you, if you talk to Jeffrey Smith, who, who I t- have talked to and I like personally, he believes his book is well documented, but it's, it's, it, it's, it's not even, wouldn't, wouldn't pass muster in, in, in a junior high school science class. What the people who write it think is, is, is well documented and what scientists believe are well documented are two very, very different things. You can maybe respond to the science. I, I guess what I think is um, a company and a scientist are, if, if they're being bribed to um, produce a, or to accept a product which is poison and that people are going to have illness and, and die from, you'll see it in the epidemiological data, you'll see it in uh, independent science that occurs after the product is out. I, I'm just skeptical of, of, of claims of conspiracy all the time. Um, maybe it's true, but I, I always am skeptical of claims of conspiracy. So let's see the data rather than claims. Okay, I just want to point out that Kevin Folta has a groupie in Twitter world. Uh, this is from Twitter. All right. It says, Kevin Folta, your presentation was awesome. Will your images be available? <laughs> <laughs> that is yes, if you don't want audio. <laughs> yeah, they're available. Us. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and uh, I'm going to do another. Uh, oh, I, I could make a quick mention there. If you want to see more Kevin Folta, he and I sat down uh, at my house when he came, back, came to Madison last fall. Um, look up on our blog, have a beer with Kevin Folta, and we had a fun discussion about this and other things. Uh, anybody in the audience next? Yes, sir. Yellow Ties had his hand up for a while. Yeah, hello, my name's Keith Allenberger. I just recently read an article where uh, wheat growing in Oregon was found to be... Uh, it was developed uh, to be resistant to Roundup. And it was, and the line was canceled by the developers, even though it obviously was successful because this wheat was growing in a field being grown, uh, be being grown, you know, and it was sprayed with Roundup, the wheat grew anyway. So obviously it did what it was. What was the unintended consequence that it's not reported that, that caused the company to cancel that line of wheat and the government of Japan to ban wheat imports from Oregon. Yeah, I, I can answer that. Um, the original wheat was in for approval back in the early 2000s, and the reason it was uh, halted, reason that the company pulled the application, was because there were threats from Asian countries and other countries that they would not accept any U.S. wheat if the GM wheat was released. At least that's the understanding I have on this. So it was a question of... Uh, serving the greater uh, non-transgenic farmer by, uh, by not continuing with that application at that time. So. Oh, yeah. Oh, I, I can add to this. Uh, so I actually put up a post on, I think, Sunday with a lot of links for people who want to find out more about that situation in Oregon. I mean, it's a very kind of strange situation because the particular farm was growing uh, like a winter wheat, which is different from spring wheat. And the, the, the field trials of the uh, herbicide tolerant wheat that Monsanto was growing in Oregon were of spring wheat, not winter wheat. So it came from somewhere else somehow, and it doesn't persist in the ground as seed. So uh, right now, I think they're really trying to figure out how exactly this happened. And uh, we may be able to find some information by testing the genome of the, uh, the plants themselves to figure out what were they crossed with, who had them where, maybe. Maybe we'll find out some more information. But uh, I mean, like things like this uh, uh, are really unfortunate. And it's like, you know, th- that's why, the, as Kevin Fulta said, uh, the, um, uh, the wheat was uh, pulled from, uh, uh, from trying to get approval with the USDA. It went through the FDA consultation process. And so they said there was no problem with regard to its health impact. But, um, uh, but for the uh, uh, for the major wheat producing exporting countries like Canada, U.S. and Australia, they all kind of agreed. Well, we're going to release a transgenic one when the world is ready for it. But now, now we got this. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to do a Twitter uh, from um, this is one again. We'd like a brief answer because I think I think I know the answer. But then again, I'm Mister Know It All. Uh, the user is at Pythagorean crank, and I'm not going to ask what that means. <laughs> um, 
that's kind of at right angles. Uh, what kind of evidence would be required to condemn GMOs? Let's go this way. All right. Uh, repeatable uh, evidence. So like you saw, like the, the, the tumors on the rats and all that, and the other claims about uh, uh, problems with uh, blood and things like that. You know, the, the hallmark of science is repeatability. And when you see one study come out that says, oh, we're, you know, we found this crazy, uh, extraordinary claim. Well, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. I mean, if you think about it, putting in a gene that, that uh, helps the plant produce an amino acid it already does, a different version of gene it already has, that this would cause something as extraordinary as tumors is, is an extraordinary claim. So you need to have that sort of stuff repeated by other researchers, um, perhaps those that don't have a stake in it. And, uh, and then if it comes out uh, that that's repeatable, then you've got something that you can say, yeah, well, this is, uh, uh, this is an actual real problem. I mean, you can purposefully genetically engineer something to be harmful. I mean, we know enough about toxin pathways in plants to be able to do that. But um, uh, so the real question is just are these, um, uh, you know, these, these kinds of uh, other changes that, um, that are well studied, are these causing problems? So far, we don't have uh, the evidence to condemn that or evidence to condemn the process itself. It would be real easy to enhance ricin production, wouldn't it? Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, there was, there's been news about, you know, ricin uh, from castor beans uh, being soaked into letters, and that is a very potent natural toxin. I mean, it, I'm not suggesting anybody do this, but it's possible to actually put that in other plants. I don't know the, the pathway myself, but, you know, it's, uh, uh, you know, these things are possible, and really just uh, you have to look at the pathway of what these changes are and really put them in the biological context of the kinds of changes we've already uh, done to plants. Uh, I'll, I'll defer to the scientists. On I that. agree with I agree with Carl. Reproducible evidence from different labs that tends to grow, and I'll tell you what: if one of those labs is going to show that it's dangerous, I hope it's mine, because whoever finds this out will be grant funded the rest of their lives. They'll have the cover of Nature and Science. It'll be a tremendously huge explosion of scientific literature that come from demonstrating conclusively that 70 percent of the food in the United States is poison. It won't be hidden in the back of a small, obscure journal. So I, it, it would take that kind of reproducibility. And as a scientist, I would be very welcome to reviewing that objectively and, 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 do, and doing what's right in, in, uh, in making sure it was published. Let's go with one more audience question, if we could, right here in the middle. I want to make sure I'm not getting anybody. OK, I'm going to take you. Thank you. Name and organization, please. Thank you. Gerald Chandler, iTech Consultants. Um, I'd like you to quantify, if you can, how dangerous or not dangerous GMO is, which is to say, after all of the thousand studies that have been made that John Entine uh, listed, can we say that uh, it increases the rate of cancer 10% or less than 1 in 10,000? Can we say that it changes life expectancy less than one day out of your whole life? Can you quantify it? I can start with that. I think so. The the overarching consensus of scientific literature is that it poses no more risks than traditionally bred crops. Okay, that's the that's the first one. In terms of quantifying its effect on health, I think if you're somebody who is in a place in the world where you're not getting enough vitamins or you're not getting enough calories, and this allows you to do it, I think it has a very strong positive effect. But as for its danger to us in the Western world, <coughs> it, it's no more than what happens with conventionally bred crops. I, I think there's a danger in thinking of genetic, uh, genetic engineering as, as, as some kind of um, block concept uh, that you can make sweeping statements about all traits. Each um, product, each different uh, plant or animal that's genetically engineered has their own set of individual circumstances that should be evaluated on its own merits. Genetic engineering is just a process. Um, there's n n we're not moving foreign genes around. We're not putting... Uh, tomato genes and fish or the other way around. We're just moving proteins. Proteins are just a way um, of, of, of the way genes work, and they're common to all plants and all animals. So the idea of moving a gene from one species to another is really someone who doesn't understand how science works. So we have to look at each individual product, each individual outcome, and say, in the way that genetics was applied, genetic engineering was applied in that particular product, is there a danger there? You can't make wild, um, umbrella-like statements about the process itself. That, I think, indicates a, a basic misunderstanding about how genetic engineering works. 
Yeah, I, I agree with uh, both uh, John and Kevin. Yeah, the broad sweeping statements, you can't make it, like all those different traits I talked about. Uh, and and uh, uh, traits like for uh, biofortifying, um, you can see where my blog gets its name, but uh, for biofortifying crops like golden rice and cassava and things like that to provide micronutrients that people are missing in a staple crop, that if uh, successful, if released, will increase the life expectancy of people if they eat it and if it works. Uh, as far as like a, uh, an effect on the number of days for us, I mean, there's, uh, there's a big debate about exactly what are the changes in pesticide use. It's the only thing I could think of right now from the traits that are out there that would really uh, indirectly affect uh, someone's life expectancy. And um, I think that the, the, the noise is much greater than the signal on that. I wouldn't be able to say up or down by even a day. Um, yeah, that's me as talking as a scientist. <laughs> Carl, I have a question for you. Where did you get the picture of the cornfish on top of the car? Oh, yeah. So um, there's a guy named uh, Adam Eidinger who, uh, uh, who made that car for a, a march from, uh, from New York to Washington, D.C. Uh, I think it was a year before last. And Cars uh, parked in my neighborhood. Oh, really? Is yes. it? Maybe oh, say. okay. Well, you should stop on and say hi. Uh, but... Um, uh, maybe I will if I if I have time next time in DC. Street, yeah, but uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, and you know it's, it's one of those examples of how this is sort of framed through art. You know, there there are no varieties of corn with genes from fish in them, but it's to bring up the ick factor, like ooh, mixing plants and animals. Um, but I mean, there are examples where nature actually does that on its own. There is an aphid called the pea aphid, which is orange, and uh, we thought that it. Uh, uh, absorbed uh, the orange color from the foods it ate, but it actually produces it itself. It produces beta carotene, and it produces it using genes that it stole from a fungus. And so there's a, fun a gene from uh, genes from a fungus that went uh, at some point in the history of this aphid into the aphid, and just like golden rice, it's like a natural GMO that's making the same thing that golden rice is making. I have a secret for everybody here. You all have genes from a virus in you, otherwise you'd be dead. They're called mitochondria. So. <laughs> or a bacterium. <laughs> uh, well, let me take one more. Oh, sure, take sure. a few. Okay, one. one more. That's take it. A... Right in the center. Thank you. Given that most Sorry, my name is Jen Bates. Uh, I'm a private citizen. Um, given that most of the spreading of anti-GMO um, material eventually comes through the mainstream media, what are you guys doing or thinking to educate the journalists of, of the mainstream media so that they are, are more even-handed, perhaps, when they deal with it? Number one, we're having this seminar. Number two, yeah. Well, I mean, we, we, we've been, uh, in what little spare time we have, been trying to build pages to help with media. One of my dreams is to put together a page of images for all media to be able to just use for free because you, the pictures of produce with needles in them are ubiquitous, and it's a real problem because there are no needles in produce to make the, you know, the, these kinds of traits. And, you know, people don't like needles. You don't like getting that, you know, that, that, that moment where you're, you know, pricked at the needle for your vaccination. Um, and it, it's really just used to sort of stir up emotion. So I want to be able to build something where, where you can actually show a bit of the process and it looks visually interesting. People can learn some more of the science. There's our, our, our atlas. Uh, we're, um, uh, later this summer, we're planning to uh, put together an, uh, another site um, and crowdsource uh, sort of a, a fact-checking uh, Snopes-like site um, to just go through the basic claims. But there's nothing up right now. We've only just got the domain name so far. <laughs> uh, it's, it, your question is actually very central to a, to a debate that's going on in the journalism community. I would say most journalists are, are liberal, moderate to liberal. Um, there's been a, 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 we're all very Twitter savvy and we follow what's going on on debates on genetically modified organisms, but I'd say over the past six to eight months, there's been a huge debate among um, journalists who covered biotechnology, many of whom, the majority of whom, just because journalists tend to be liberal, are liberal-minded. And um, I think for many, many years, um, they have been afraid to um, uh, literally put their head above, above the parapet on this issue. In other words, they've aligned with the political left on a lot of issues. And for, for whatever reason, um, anti-biotechnology has become a litmus test among a certain faction of the political left. Um, and I'd say over the past six months to a year, you've seen um, a willingness by journalists who otherwise would not necessarily weigh in on this issue to now say, 
you know, we care for science. Um, we've talked about issues, whether the debate over climate change is one thing put out there as, a, as, as, a, as an issue that the left journalists have weighed in very heavily and organizations like Mother Jones and Grist have weighed in. Maybe we should actually um, stand up and talk on this issue. And I, the catalyzation movement was the Seralini study that was released last fall and the attempt by um, Seralini to restrict access to a study except to supporters and um, didn't pre-release the study um, to have a general critique by journalists so that when the study actually formally came out, there'd be a balance of studies. There was a huge outcry by the journalism community. That event combined with the conversion of a guy named Mark Linus, who's a British journalist, who in January of this year went public uh, with his um, willingness to admit that he no longer opposes genetically modified organisms, which was a major event because Mark Linus is reputedly the one who coined the term Frankenfoods, and he was a Greenpeace activist, and he says, you know, I quoted him in my talk, the failure of communication on genetically modified organisms is one of the, literally, the communications catastrophes of the last 50 years. So I think that there's now a willingness and an aggressiveness by journalists, many of whom who consider themselves liberal and have been afraid to speak out, to say, we're gonna talk the science, let the political consequences, ideological consequences um, fall by the uh, wayside, and I'm, I'm hoping that that movement will, will, will gain more traction, it seems to have over the past six to nine months. Yeah, briefly, I, I think that what I would like to see and what I would like to do is invite the journalists that are most opposed to the technology, those from Mother Jones and other places, to realize that I share most of their values with respect to everything else that they publish and everything else they, they write about. It's just one issue that we differ on, and it's because I know an awful lot about it. And I, I would invite them to let's sit down and talk about it, because what this needs is more honest discussion and less shock, fear, and hyperbole.